If you could turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Um, last week we, we read the latter part of Romans chapter 7, as well as the verses we're going to read today to give us some context. But um, our message this morning is going to be in Romans chapter 8, and I'll read for us verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So one of the, the really wonderful things um, about repeatedly going through and reading and studying a certain passage for a period of time is that the more that you, you move through the passage and the more that you look into the context and the more that you pray over it and the more that, uh, that you write and think about it, it sort of changes. Your perspective changes on it and, and the aspects of it that, that really stand out, that kind of changes as well. And this week, the way that I was going to present the message changed in about the middle of the week. And the one word that really leapt off to the page to me as I was going through this, was the word now. And it's a, it's a pivotal word in this chapter, right at the beginning, but it's a pivotal word for us in the canon of Scripture. And it really made me think about a lot of different things. And I thought about, uh, I thought about a trip that I had to South Korea in 2007. I had a friend who was a, English teacher there, and we went from where he lived in South Korea, we went to the demilitarized zone, the DMZ, and that's this swath of land that separates North Korea and South Korea, and at that time, they were still technically at war. There was an armistice, which is basically a pause, but they technically were were still at war, and you have this, this zone that separates the countries that is full of active landmines, and it is full of traps and you have people on the North Korea side in towers watching and if anyone tries to flee into South Korea they shoot them I don't know if you remember a few years back there was a guy who made it he made it through he had been shot five times and when he got into South South Korea he had all manner of diseases things that are quite curable uh, he was extremely ill and had been malnourished, and he had these these tales of treatment for not just um, the the lowly citizens of North Korea, but for even the soldiers and the the poverty and the abuse and the tyranny. And they live under this system where uh, Kim Jong Un or Kim Jong Il, depending on your time frame, was. They were God, and they were worshipped as such. And people today continually are killed because they flee North Korea to try to get into South Korea where they can have a monochrome of freedom. And the tour guide did a really good job of, of painting this picture of what that was like to live in North Korea, which we really don't know much because... We, we don't have satellite images. We don't have uh, access to a lot of information. Their uh, news media is very controlled. So we don't really know what it's like except for cases like this guy who escaped. And it was really bad. And so I thought about this week, what would it be like if someone were to open a 200-yard strip from South Korea straight into North Korea that was completely clear, and the, and the border would be open in such that anyone who wanted to flee from North Korea into South Korea could do so unmolested. And I thought about that because I thought about what it was like for, particularly for the, the uh, Jewish audience that Paul had for this letter to Rome. Because he begins to say, there is therefore now no condemnation. So this word now, is it's a hinge. We have moved from a time where people lived under condemnation. People understood very clearly that 
the things that I do in my life, that I will be judged according to these things, and that uh, I my fate is determined upon these things. And then you have the context of all of Scripture that particularly people in in Jewish culture would understand to say that you're born into sin, that your nature is sinful, that there is none good, no, not one, and that apart from God, you're incapable of doing good. So Paul brings this this context, and we talked about last week, Paul is almost in despair because of his sin. The righteous life I want to live, I can't live that way. Um, I, I am under the under the law of sin. We talk about what's the purpose of the law. The law is, is perfect, but the law is flawed in us because we can't keep it. We can't keep any of the law, let alone all of the law. And then it says, you know, lest one jot or tittle fall away, you, you, you break the whole law if you break it at any point. So it's this, this weight, this, this tyrannical sense that we are enslaved to our sin and we have no hope. The border is closed. There's no way for us to move from where we are into a place where there's no condemnation. But then Paul opens and says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I thought about the law and what it is like to be under the condemnation of the law. If you break the law, you are subject to the legal system that we have. And there are penalties that have to be paid depending on on what the, the severity of your offense is. And, but you live under that condemnation. Anybody ever get a, a, a notice in the mail? You have traffic school because you broke the speed limit and, or you have a court date that's looming ahead because of something you've done. You feel that condemnation and the shame and the dread and the financial aspect, all those different parts of it. So for us to not live under condemnation, this is a, this is a kind of a radical concept and a radical idea and maybe something that's easier for us to to equivocate this with is if we think about the image of of an american slave during the time of lincoln when he gave his emancipation proclamation if you were a, a slave born in this country born into slavery this is all you've ever known all of your life You've lived under, under the tyranny of someone who literally owned you. Someone who literally dictated everything that you could do. If you had rights and if you had privileges, if you had things that you enjoyed, it's because someone else gave those to you. So you lived under this cloud of slavery and you lived under the brutality of that system. But could you imagine when you first heard of this proclamation that slaves are free, they no longer are beholden to their master, no one owns anyone, that would be an almost incomprehensible thing, especially if this is, if you're several generations in born into slavery. That would be a difficult concept to grasp, and it's an imperfect emancipation. Why? Because they still weren't people. A freed slave was two-fifths of a person. And not even at the Emancipation Proclamation were they two-fifths of a person. This is later, legislatively, they became two-fifths of a person in respect to the law. Your vote counts for two-fifths. And it would be a hundred years before things would really start to change, and they began began to have equality with other people. But this isn't so with us and with Christ. Because we move from complete condemnation. We're born into bondage to sin. Why do I 
continue to sin? Why do I love my sin? That's the flesh we were born into. And as a, as a lost person, I had some guilt or I had some understanding that what I was doing was wrong, but I had no context for why, and I didn't care because my desire was for my flesh. My desire was for me and for my kingdom. But when Christ came and put in me a different heart, I continued to sin, but I understood at least better what this sin was. And we live under this sin as Christians if we continue in the sin that we indulged in before we were Christians, it's like we're in prison, but the door has been ripped off, yet we refuse to leave. And this is an important distinction. If, you, if you're not in Christ, if you've not been made a new creation, it's impossible for you to please God. It is impossible for you to atone for your sin. But if you are in Christ then the debt has already been paid. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus. If we look at the characteristics of God, if we look at His attributes, and we study those, we begin to see some things about God, particularly His immutability. Immutability means God isn't moved. God doesn't go from saying, I love this person today, but tomorrow I probably will hate them, but then I might love them again the next day. This isn't, this isn't the un, uneven ground or unsteady ground that we, that we live on. In Christ, His love is eternal. And God doesn't put us on a, a scale and continue to measure. When we are in Christ... Our sins are forgiven. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if this is the case, if we can go from being slaves and enemies of God, not just to being out of that system into a, a, an imperfect one, but to go from being enemies of God to being heirs with Christ, how does that happen? Because this changes everything, right? This isn't us making incremental improvements in our life until we're good enough that God can notice us and decide to invest some time in us. No, this is us being mired in our filth, having God come down into that situation and pluck us out. <coughs> How? Because the law of the Spirit of God, which He puts in us, has set us free from what? From the law of sin and death. If you are a, a human being today, you have experienced these concepts of sin and death. We inherently can understand things that we do are wrong. If not, why not do everything that you do out in the open? Why do anything in the pri in privacy? Let's just lay it all out because we understand there is sin. We have guilt. God has placed in us this idea, this ability to recognize that things that we do are wrong. As we read the scripture, as God changes our heart and we begin to understand the holiness of God, the, the better we understand the holiness of God, the more we come to hate our sin because we know that it's an offense to him. We know that it's a stench in his nostrils. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free. When we have been set free, that means we no longer have to live in bondage to sin. We still live in our sinful flesh. We still are subject to temptation. We still are weak, but we have no condemnation. And we have a Redeemer. We have Christ that we can turn to. We can have victory over our sin. And we will, as Christians, have ultimate victory over our sin. When we die, we have ultimate victory over our sin. And that doesn't mean that we just kind of skate from here to there. 
Our aim, as we'll see as we continue on reading in Romans, is to put to death our sin, to practice putting to death our sin. So if you're here and you are you are a Christian and you're wrestling with sin that you can't put to death, be encouraged this morning. Be encouraged to know that victory is already won. That we are free from those sins. We don't have to live under that. We have a means to escape. We have a we have an advocate that we can turn to. And if you're healed here today and you're still living in the, under the bondage of sin, if you're in a cycle of destructive behavior that you can't break, then I would implore you to seek the ultimate emancipator. That you go before God, confess your sin, and fall on His mercy. Plea for this freedom of bondage. Pray that God would change your heart of stone into a heart of flesh so that you no longer live under the condemnation of sin. So you can move on that that, that pendulum of the, the word now, you can move into no condemnation, that you can be in Christ Jesus. Throw yourself on God's mercy. Confess your sins, plead for freedom for bondage, and ask Ask God to become Lord of your life. So our our message today from Romans 8, 1 and 2 is that the way has been made that we, according to God's perfect plan, do not have to live under condemnation. That if you are in Christ, we certainly don't have to live in bondage to our sin. We've been set free. Understand that and let that understanding um, bring you out of those those patterns. And if if you are not in Christ today, what is your plan? <coughs> what option do you have? How do you intend to atone for your sin? Because we will all face judgment the righteous judgment of God. Next week, um, we're going to look at two other chapters. Um, I believe it's two. As we look into the law a little farther and, and how our flesh interacts with the law of God. So if you want to go ahead and read, I would encourage you to read all of Romans 8. We read it last week, but if you if you can, um, read through it again so you have some understanding of where we're going. But we can see this relationship between us and the law a little better, and it's, it is important. Um, so let's pray together as we finish it. Father, this morning we are grateful for an opportunity to... Uh, go through this class to look into membership we know that you value and we ask that uh, you would uh, be with dale as he uh, brings this lesson today and as uh, we learn what is required to build the foundations of your church we also can understand and see very clearly the the way that you have designed everything for your glory and, and we pray that that would be our aim today in christ's name amen